I, 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 I was very favorably inclined towards the uh, records and tuples proposal simply yeah. because it gave us a way, it gave us one more place where we wouldn't have to use Harden. And it, in particular, it gave us a way to express. Um, and, okay. uh, and Recording is on. Let me sort of recap to give a little bit of context. I'll try to do it quickly. So um, uh, we've got several agenda topics today. The particular thing that uh, I got started with is the question, uh, are records and tuples um, permanently deadlocked on minus zero? Because as far as I can tell, the answer is yes. Um, uh, the problem is that the only sensible semantics for, after much debate, I, I became convinced the only sensible semantics for a singleton uh, tuple of zero, triple equal singleton tuple of minus zero is yes, they're triple equal because uh, triple equal should be recursively triple equal. Um, and uh, otherwise using an array is to, I mean, using a tuple to represent, let's say, a singleton vector is inconsistent with, with arithmetic on scalars, if you're just trying to think of these arithmetically. Um, uh, uh, at the same time, the way to achieve that by coercion on entry, where, where a tuple of minus zero, trying to formulate a tuple of minus zero becomes a tuple of zero, making that happen on entry, uh, it, it conflicts with um, uh, the storage and retrieval semantics of minus zero in normal arrays, which doesn't do any coercion and is just surprising from a perspective of values as computationally observable entities. So I think that there is a sensible semantics here. I think there's exactly one sem sensible semantics and the implementers have vetoed uh, their ability to implement that one uh, or their willingness to implement that one because of the difficulty of the, the kind of memoization for doing a quick comparison of, um, uh, of these things. You'd have to memoize equivalence classes rather than memoize only one. Um, uh, and uh, without the implementers being willing to do that one, I don't think that there's any other semantics uh, that, is, that, is, that is, I think there is no semantics that is both something we can get implementers to agree to implement and that is defensible. So I think they're just at lot. So um, with harden, if I harden an array um, and then I harden a different array that has the same values inside it, um, uh, do the two different harden are the two different hardened arrays triple equals or no? No, definitely not. Definitely okay. not. Um, then the, the 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 defining difference is that um, right. <clears throat> so um, this feels like this is very frustrating because this feels like both. Yes, I can see that this is a real problem that is thorny to resolve, and at the same time, this feels like a really stupid problem to get stuck on. Well. Because it's like a, this 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 really general, generally useful abstraction, which yeah. is hung up on this minor edge case detail. Yeah, but but keep in mind that our intuitions about scale, uh, um, things that are minor discrepancies can often stop the world. I mean, the, the, oh, I, I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm just saying it seems silly that it is true. I'm not yeah. denying it's truth. I'm just saying, who ordered that? Yeah, yeah. Um, just I was, I was. When, whenever this kind of scale intuition uh, goes through my head, I always try to remind myself of the Michelson Morley experiment. <laughs> Such a tiny little discrepancy. That's an excellent. Uh, that's an excellent analogy. Yeah. So, um, uh, I'll. I'll so let me let me talk about the uh, what I think um, remains attractive, and in fact, in a world without records and tuples, becomes uh, that much more attractive. Um, is one of the really cool things about records and tuples 
is that when you have multiple workers, agents, VATs, processes, I'll just, for the, for the pur purpose of this recording, I'll just use the, the ECMAScript standards term agent, which is my least favorite of all the terms, um, uh, but, but is therefore neutral. Um, when you have multiple agents that implementationally are in one operating system address space, uh, you can safely communicate deeply immutable data between them, deeply immutable identity for data between them, like the traditional JavaScript primitives, but also like records and tuples, which can be arbitrarily deep. Uh, as long as you know that they're deeply only data, um, uh, then you can pass them between threads, between agents sharing an address space, uh, by just passing a pointer without, without any copy overhead. That's under the assumption that you're wanting, running one garbage collector over the whole thing so they can share heap representation. Um, if there's separate heaps and separate garbage collectors, then you still have to copy. There's no way around that. Um, but uh, what uh, Peter, Peter Hottie and um, uh, Patrick Soke of uh, Modable uh, pointed out is that in their world where there's only one realm and all the primordials are frozen, you know, their CES world, uh, and all the primordials are frozen, uh, they can take deeply frozen immutable object structures and directly pass them between agents because they're completely thread safe. If they're deep and, and the thing that's the, that, that, you know, I kind of understood at the time, but it only struck me yesterday in correspondence with Peter, is that the fact that both, both agents, you know, all the agents that are communicating this way share a single set of frozen primordials with a single set of object identities means that you have a cross agent realm and it works. All of the objects that contain any mutable state reachable anywhere within them are completely disjoint object graphs between the agents. But anything that is purely transitively immutable, that has no, muta that has no mutability reachable anywhere in, in that subgraph, are completely shareable between the agents because the two agents are, are really in one realm because all the primordials only have a single identity. You don't have to translate identities when you, trans when you move these objects between the agents. So that's just kind of mind blowing. And the other um, you know, preference, the model will express that I've come to be in agreement with, especially with this perspective of um, um, a single, a single realm across multiple agents uh, is that, well, we've already got frozen objects, we've already got some degree to reason about immutability of object subgraphs, or CES would not have been possible, um, that rather than introducing a whole new set of data types for immutability, uh, invest in supporting better the immutability of the objects we've got. And uh, I, I can I can I can feel I can ar genuinely argue and genuinely feel both sides of that argument, but I do think that records and tuples are deadlocked on minus zero. So uh, I'm now much more inclined towards Peter's side of that argument. And 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 and, and in any case, the CES group has been needing to see more investment happen in immutability for object graphs anyway, such as with Harden and with Purify and with Lockdown, et cetera. So the um... As, as I was starting to say when we, we kind of took a detour to, to deal with getting recording going on all of that, one of the great, one of the useful virtues to me of the records and tuples proposal is that um, it gives a way, it gives a programmer a, a, a convenient affordance for expressing uh, a complicated immutable structure uh, as a literal. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, it's a first class literal, um, uh, rather than having to create a mutable thing and then later transmogrify it into an immutable thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you're expressing your intention up front 
that the thing you're constructing is going to be immutable. Yeah. But from the point of view of pro programmer readability, I mean, as we, as we now have tremendous amount of experience programming in CES, <laughs> is that harden and then within the harden parentheses, just writing out a big nested you know, object literal, array literal, function literal, um, as we do, where all of the stuff there is just appearing literally, um, uh, harden of that does produce, well, ignoring the functions for a moment, harden of that does produce something immutable mm -hmm. uh, with functions. Uh, it does or does not, depending on what the functions lexically, lexically capture, but it certainly produces something hardened. Yes, uh, my, my, my issue is harden is just, I detest it from a notational point of view. Um, um, I hate, I would, I would much, I would like to be sort of just reflexively, anytime I'm creating something that's going to be immutable, have it be immutable, but having hardened sprinkled all throughout my code is just horrible. Um, and it would be great if there were a lighter weight way to express that, um, which the, the, the records and tuples proposal gives us. Um, and um, there's a separate question of, of, you know, how efficient is it and how fast is it and all of that. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm counting on implementation magic to deal with that ultimately. Yeah, I think that, that the kind of static analysis that we do in our head when we see a harden around a bunch of literal, just expressed literally in line, we know that it's transitive across at least what's being literally expressed. Um, I think that engines could do a lot of that static analysis safely once hardened yeah. is recognized by the flat. Yeah. Um, there, have, there have been proposals uh, actually much older than records and tuples, I think starting with Brendan, uh, to say, let's just introduce a um, more declarative syntax for, for, for uh, expressing literal structure that is, that is born frozen, that for expressing frozen literals directly. Yeah, I mean, if, if there were like a, a unary prefix operator character that meant the same thing as hardened parent, closed parent, um, I, I would be thrilled. I mean, the, the, so the, the thing one can contemplate is, that, and I think this goes back to sort of the history of the notation, uh, is that whatever notation was proposed for records and tuples, if records and tuples are deadlocked, just have that notation be a way to write frozen objects. Right. And what we, what we lose with that is the ability to compare that, compare two structures with triple equals, um, right. which is the thing they're stuck on. And since we don't have that now, um, it's, 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 it's an improvement from a notational perspective. It doesn't deal with this other inconvenience, but we already had to deal with that other inconvenience. So it is a strict improvement. Yeah. And, and, you know, what that means is that, that, that when you do want to do a structural comparison rather than an identity comparison of these kinds of structures, uh, you need to, uh, you know, introduce a new library comparison thing like we have categoric with our same structure thing. Recursively mm -hmm. blocks um, yeah. these structures, and that requires a you know um, sort of another. Um, it requires a semantic stance above just what JavaScript gives us about at what point you know what are you taking as the indicator of what substructure should be recursively compared structurally versus which substructure are actually objects that should still be, that should be interpreted as objects with identity and compared by identity. And we have that at Goric with pass by copy objects versus presences. Um, and I think that's the right thing for doing distributed object programming. And distributed object programming is really sort of the right starting point for thinking about uh, multi-agent programming anyway. So maybe this all comes together, but now, now I'm taking many big ifs, the long chain of ifs there. Right, I mean, I think that the, if I understood your comment about um, the thing you 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 grokked from Peter, um, it's that essentially the, the um, sort of the moral equivalent of, well, it's all in ROM, so it's never gonna change, um, is, is, is that in fact, you can do pointer comparison because that's just how it is.
uh, I mean, the, 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 the semantics include this, the, the object identity. So, you, so and, and you can do it because the object is at a place in, in the address. Uh -huh. Uh, I see what you're saying. You're saying is if the objects happen to be identical, you can skip the recursive tree walk uh, because you know they're going to be the same, um, but that's just an optimization. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So. What were the other things? Oh. I think it's worth keeping in mind in this whole discussion that um, with the pursuit of symbols as weak map keys, that a bunch of the record and tuple work actually can become polyfillable in practice and, and does reduce down to a solvable problem. Uh, uh, say more. I don't. I don't. I don't follow. So, because because symbols carry identity with them, uh, a, a normalization of a structure that is record and tuple compatible becomes possible, and then another one of the big benefits is being able to use them as lookup keys, where the symbol just is effectively a proxy in your polyfill of the hopeful future record and tuples in the language. I'm still not following. I, I, I really don't so have so given, given two structures, you can run them through a process that will emit the very same symbol if they, if they are in the same equivalence class for your application specific logic. And then that symbol itself is a proxy for the data structure behind it. Okay. Um, but the, since it's an equivalence class, uh, it's that there's multiple of these things that have to, that would map to the same symbol and the symbol doesn't map back to any one of them uniquely. Well, that, that would be up to you, right? If, if your equivalence class is that all distinct values, uh, all value distinctions are relevant, then you always get a different symbol for a different input. But if for instance, negative zero and positive zero should be treated equivalently, then you would ignore the distinction in the process that maps from data structure to symbol and there and then the reverse as well. So the, the reverse is the thing I have a problem with. The um, if you ever look up one of these things from the symbol, you're looking up one of the many ele elements of the equivalence class which are observably distinct from each other. So a many to one mapping for the equivalence class preserves the equivalence class, but a, any reverse mapping breaks the, the symmetry. Yes. Okay. So is this, um, would this be a hat? Uh, could you use the, the hash consing thing with the, would you have to use weak refs to do this efficiently? I don't think so. I think there are, I think there are multiple options for it. And hash consing in particular, when you look at an implementation is as far as we can tell is viable. Okay. So at the user level, you don't have to do it in the language? I think so. Okay. So um, other items on the agenda? Ah, membrane prerequisites, yes. So, um, this criteria that, that we talked about about the separation well, that's the that, that's the place where you know, we in this group were very much leveraging the, the anticipated existence of records and tuples uh, and the um, uh, in terms of you know, the multi-run world uh, in order to have a separation 
and enforce separation between the realms, uh, but still be able to build membranes pleasantly. Uh, Peter's observation, of course, only applies for interagent communication within one realm. It doesn't help communicating between realms. Um, and uh, frozen objects, of course, can't be directly communicated um, without breaching the object graph isolation, separation that we're trying to enforce. So, uh, so that's the place where I don't know how to recover from loss of records and people. Uh, my main point that I was trying to raise is, you know, we've got so many proposals in the mix, um, membranes being one of the goals of those proposals. And eventually we eventually, Mark, per our discussion um, almost three years ago, we were thinking, hey, it might be a good idea to present uh, membranes as something to actually add in to TC39, or I'm sorry, ECMA 262, simply because of the complexity of implementing them. Yes, yes. Um, um, and, and so I'm just thinking, is it time that we started writing down what pieces we think are necessary to do membranes the right way? Yes, absolutely. Well, in particular, if membranes are supported as part of the, the language as a first class abstraction, it's conceivable to me that some of the hoops we've had to jump through to um, to to do it from the outside, particularly some of the things which are obstructions to membrane transparency, um, which could be overcome if you're in cahoots with the, the JavaScript implementation. Um, might be attractive. And then the question is, you know, well, what are those things? I'm very, very skeptical of that. Um, if you can't do it at the user level using proxies and weak maps, then if you do it at the language level, if somehow you do at the language level something you couldn't do at the user level, then you've introduced um, new abilities that somehow violate the semantics of the limitations we currently have. Uh, and I think that the, that the, that the, the non-transparency problems that we've got, we've got actually for, for inescapable reasons. Right, I mean, I'm, I was thinking of, um, you know, uh, weak refs as, a, as an example of something which, which you could not implement um, mm -hmm. in the language. Um, a lot of the machinery surrounding them could be implemented in the language, but there's this sort of thing in the middle that you absolutely have to do uh, in the engine. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's a similar thing here. So uh, it's certainly worth looking for. Uh, altogether, I'm skeptical. Proxies and weak maps were introduced in order to enable membranes to be built as transparently as possible at the user level. Uh, and uh, it's transparently possible that we're still maintaining good security properties and, and, and all that. And um, the various attempts to make them in some dimensions more transparent have either created a lot more complexity or breached their security. Um, uh, so, I, I, so I, this doesn't seem to me like an artifact of the fact that we're building them out of finer grain material. Well, I, I mean, I'm, membranes are something I only have kind of a finger, fingernails grasp understanding of some of the subtleties. And so, um, you know, take that, take that for, you know, as a, as a disclaimer, but um, I guess with, with, with membrane non-transparency, um, some of the non-transparencies are implementation artifacts that are just annoying. And some of them are, in some sense, they're features. They're, they're the things, the very things that are the, the, the reason why you, you want to have a, a, a membrane and not just pass the object through directly. Um, that there's some, some actual, some, some barrier, you know, there's the distortion that's happening, which is by definition, not transparent. And so uh, I don't know that we have a clean 
uh, uh, explication of the, the, the differentiation between these two categories. Yeah, we, we do. The, the only barrier between a membrane between realms acting like a direct realm boundary, um, uh, uh, other than incredibly obscure edge cases, and I'll get back to the edge cases in a moment, uh, but other than the incredibly obscure edge cases, the only barrier we've got is that uh, internal slots and the built-in methods that recognize them recognize the internal slots across realms, whereas they cannot recognize the internal slots across a membrane across realms or ac across a membrane period um, uh, because there's no secure theory for doing that. Um, and the thing that retroactively, if we could change in the language, would simply repair the problem is to say mm -hmm. that that internal slots and the um, methods that recognize them are all per realm and there's no cross realm recognition of internal slots. If we could retroactively refit that into the language, then as far as I can tell, um, uh, membranes between realms would be a perfect emulation of a non-membrane realm boundary, except for these obscure edge cases. And the obscure edge cases are also just specification accidents that we're stuck with, uh, such as uh, in reflect.construct, what happens if you leave off the third argument, which is the, uh, the constructor from which to get the prototype to grant as the prototype of the newly constructed object. Um, when Agoric's uh, early realm shim was breached by Xmilia H, um, uh, that was one of the um, main mechanisms that Xmilia H used to breach us, I think more than once, which is that, that very weird constructor leak. And that's just a spec accident. Um, if the, um, uh, the problem is that once the spec accident was faithfully implemented by all the major engines, uh, it was no longer something we could back out of. Um, and um, uh, there was also um, a weird thing that x h leverage, which I think is not a spec accident, but is certainly bizarre, which is when you build the membrane and you're doing things like triple equals to gather the arguments that... Or it was... Um... It was it was triple dot exposed triple dot. the array from the other I'm sorry, um, across the realm boundary. Yes, yes, triple dot, and when you're doing triple dot to yeah, and and it's the arrays, it's the iterators. Uh, so there's ways to 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 abuse the so so basically you had to build the member build the mechanism where you you try to rigorously avoid any use of triple dot and rigorously audit all the uses that you do, thinking in terms of how triple dot um, uh, is implicitly calling on user overridable iteration behavior. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, this, this is the kind, this, once you've reduced the internal slot, once you've waved a magic wand, made the internal slot problem go away, these are the remaining anomalies. Uh, so you've really reduced it down to something that um, for a, you know, a carefully written membrane that prevents this kind of cross realm leakage is not breaking anything other than attack code. Which is exactly the code that you want the, the the separation mechanism to break. Because if you're not breaking the attack code, why did you bother putting something between the realms in the first place? Uh, before we dive too deep into this, I do want to raise another thing, and this is one of the reasons why I said maybe it's time to start a repository for a an API discussion. Um, 
I'm wondering if it's, I'm, I'm thinking one of the issues we would need to raise is where do membranes fit in the ECMA space? Do they belong in the main specification? Do they belong in a standard library that um, would be provided um, per discussions I remember from a couple of years ago? Or do they, or are they non-normative? Do they need to be in a guide? So I'll, I'll, let me let me state a position here, which is the first place they should show up formally in ECMA 262 is as a uh, high level invariant uh, using you know leveraging Yulia's uh, initiative to try to get to state invariants normatively in the spec. There should be a normative statement that uh, membranes must remain implementable. Uh, both securely and with the level of, of, of practical transparency that they currently have, and with their ability to support distortability, that all of those requirements should be stated normatively so that anything that's, that's proposed that would cause future membranes to lose any of those properties can be flagged as violating a normative invariant. I think that's the first place they should show up. Next place they should show up is integration testing in test 262, which is not the 262 spec, but is part of the overall TC39 process. Um, uh, then uh, example membranes can certainly be, um, uh, will certainly be present in those integration tests. Uh, and then I think there is a longer term process of experimenting with Parameter. Oh, sorry. That, I'm sorry. One more. One more. One more normative step. That's in the shorter term, which is that the separation mechanism proposed for realms that uh, we need to to satisfy ourselves that the membranes that have the properties that we're stating can still be implemented naturally on top of the separation mechanism. Uh, where the separation mechanism itself guarantees the separation irrespective of a bug, bug in the membrane. It's a very nice division of responsibility. Uh, and that means that the, the, the remaining membrane code on top of the separation mechanism is only responsible for um, uh, transparency and distortions because it cannot breach the separation. Um, and then uh, finally, I think we should be doing research towards an actual membrane library as an abstraction mechanism that has a sufficiently general way of expressing distortions that all the variations on membranes that we've been talking about that we find attractive, including the Salesforce near membranes, uh, can all be expressed naturally in terms of distortions over a, um, a a very, very neutral uh, um, parameterizable membrane abstraction that in the absence of parameterizing, in the absence of parameterizing is as transparent as possible. That was a lot. Um, <laughs> um, we have to review the notes to capture all that, Mark. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the roadmap for membranes in my head. There, there can't have not been something controversial there. So, so please argue with me, everybody. Um, I don't have an argument per se, but um, like I said, the main goal of, what, of this agenda item that I brought up was, can we at least establish a place in GitHub where we can say, okay, we're gonna write this article for TC39 to consider. And it, it mainly is a, um, a written gathering point for all the issues that we think are going to come up, the requirements, etc. I just want to have a, a, a home for it, I guess, mm -hmm. is the best way to put it. Something that's um, vendor neutral, since I have my membrane. Uh, um, Salesforce has theirs, uh, LavaMote, MetaMask. They are, they are, every, it's starting to actually, we're starting to see a small prolifer proliferation, which is a good thing. Um, 
But if we want to move beyond libraries that can only do partial transparency, we got to have a we got to have a home to discuss it. Yep, yep. I do think that all of these. I mean, I am very hopeful, but I I I do think that arriving at a single parameterizable membrane abstraction um, that will that can serve all these needs is is going to be a, a significant you know significant project that's going to require you know uh, but I do think that there all these things have enough in common um, there's sort of this core mechanism that, that, that they all must have in common that I'm very hopeful that we will find, that common library abstraction that we can all agree on such that we can all build our particular membranes by parameterizing it. So my, my take on this is uh, um, a few, few comments I've been listening. Um, so normally we could present something to TC39 in a form of a information, but that one normally doesn't have much lags in terms of Follow up. It's just like um, while uh, a, a formal proposal, um, in a very even if it is very sketchy and it's not complete and so on, but um, a, a formal proposal, which we know stage zero is for free, and if if you think that we want to attack that uh, from the high level perspective, the high level API perspective. Then we should have a, a proposal, a simple proposal, explaining what is the the general idea and what what are we trying to achieve with that. And if the committee is interested on on that kind of um, uh, topic, and, um, and it's okay uh, for for the group to spend time on it, then we we go to in stage one, and then we go from there. Um, I'm on the opinion in general. I'm on the opinion that it's too early on um, to come up with a solution for membranes because we still have a very, very little experience on membranes. That's my opinion, but I believe there are some smaller actions that we might be able to take in order to facilitate the creation of membranes. And maybe that's what you're talking about. Maybe that's really what this is about. Like just looking for how can we make it easy for people to implement the membrane in user land? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that has a better chance than, than uh, a, a high level API for membranes. So I, 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 I think you're, I think that's compatible with, with my sense of the roadmap, which is the, the high level API, which is an agreed you know, membrane abstraction mechanism, as opposed to just a, a pattern that people follow, uh, is sort of the last step on my roadmap. Um, and everything else is, is about supporting membrane patterns um, without a, one, one ag agreement on a membrane organization, um, but where the uh, separation mechanism enforces the separation. One of the things I think will be very clarifying is when we rebuild membranes on top of the separation mechanism and we introduce the distortion parameterization uh, is that means that uh, the, the only distortions we can express are distortions that don't breach separation, uh, which I think will be very clarifying. I think that so far, the basic membrane has been enforcing separation, but then it's allowed distortions where, the, where a bug in the distortion could breach the separation. And it'll be very nice to be constrained not to be able to express such distortions. don't have anything to add other than repeating myself. <laughs> uh, uh, just to make sure I'm, I'm clear, uh, if you did repeat yourself, is there anything that disagrees with, with anything I've been saying? Nope. Um, okay. The only thing I would say, Mark, is that you're looking at the details a little more closely than I am. 
I'm just looking for a, a, a place where we can hang our hats um, mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. where we can start fleshing this stuff out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, maybe the first place to start is trying to write up the high level invariant of what we mean when we say membranes must remain possible. Because that's the thing that should go into the actual ECMA spec first. And it's the you know, first application of Yulia's whole initiative to try to get high level invariants into the spec. Uh, and as an invariant that's writing down um, uh, what is already implicit in the current spec, it's not, it's not normatively changing uh, uh, any observable property in the current spec. It's just, it just, it's just stating more of it normatively. Um, uh, that it wouldn't even need to be a proposal making it through the stages. It would be more like a PR, or maybe, you know, maybe, maybe this serves as a test case to decide: Do we need something that's more formal than a PR, but less formal than a full proposal making it through the stages for these invariants? This, that's the uh, the needs consensus treatment, right? Yeah, yeah, needs a needs consensus PR. That's right. So the the thing that comes to mind when I think about that is a the is the need for a treatment of the existing exceptions hmm. and how much supporting material that actually requires. I think none. I think no supporting information to document the exceptions would be too little, but we also wouldn't want to dump a bunch of stuff into the spec that isn't otherwise relevant. So, so uh, what do you mean by the exception? So things like, well, well, basically anything that would not be incorporated from scratch where, where you talk about the practical transparency of membranes that is, that is not absolute. Mm -hmm. Things like uh, the ability to detect, uh, to deal with promises in a different way that actually, um, short circuits when they are native. Um, array dot is array comes to mind. And I think there are a few other examples. Probably they all resolve around uh, internal slots one way or another. They, they do. Yeah. Uh, array dot is array is actually uh, uh, the one that is transparent, but it's transparent because of the special case. So it sort of stands out yep. in our understanding of what's going on here. So basically, I think the form that I imagine it would be that, that this is this is the goal. These are the uh, constraints imposed upon future changes, and these are the pre-existing exceptions that uh, cannot be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. This is this is this is the the shortfall of practical transparency versus full transparency. And that gap must not widen. Yep. And you know the, the wonderful thing about this whole, you know, new consensus around realms that we need an enforced separation mechanism between realms because uh, the. Uh, the, the leakage of trying to separate yourself is, is too hazardous. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, that makes it, that, that suddenly I think will make it very vivid to people why this, this um, uh, fight to preserve practical transparency has been so important because you know, suddenly with the separation mechanism, um, uh, realms separated are going to act differently than direct object object contact in these ways. And you know, we have succeeded at preserving practical inter-realm programming uh, in a way that's preserved across this, um, this change uh, because we've defended practical transparency.
Well, we're coming to the end of our time here. There are, um, uh, well, I don't know what to say. I have nothing else. What are the norms for recording? Um, when nobody else has anything more to say that they want recorded, you know, the, the recorded meeting has wound down, uh, then we can turn off recording and ask if anybody has anything to say with the recording off. Why don't we go ahead and do that? Uh,